My name is Craig Horn, and I am delighted to have the opportunity this afternoon to welcome and introduce leading military women, commanders and trailblazers of the United States military. We are especially fortunate today to be joined by Susan Helms, Woman Vaught, and Samantha Whitaker. Lieutenant General Susan Helms, former commander of the 14th Air Force and the United States Air Force Space Command. Ladies and gentlemen, this woman has indeed touched the stars. She's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy in 1980 and became an astronaut in 1991. She was the first U.S. military woman in space. She has five space flights under her belt, 211 days in space. That's incredible, <laughs> including, including a record-breaking eight hours and 56 minutes spacewalk. That's pretty hard to imagine, actually. <laughs> she was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame in 2011. She's a recipient of the Distinguished Service Medal, the United States Air Force Commendation Medal, and NASA's Distinguished Service Medal. I'm pleased to have you welcome Lieutenant General Susan Helms. I would also like to, re rep to represent, introduce Wilma Vaught. Wilma is president of the Board of Directors of Women in Military Service for America Memorial Foundation. And you can see that memorial, I believe, over at Arlington Cemetery. Her last duty assignment in uniform was commander of the Military Entrance Processing Command. For all of you that, you that came into the military active duty, we all have our particular memories of that first day. Getting in, getting your shots, getting, getting poked around, but understanding how important it was that we have the right people in the right place to do the right thing. Wilma Vaught was a, is a member of the board of the National Women's History Museum and one of the most highly decorated women in history. We are indeed fortunate to have with us today General William, Wilma Vaught. Thank you. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, the modern military, Samantha Whitaker, is in the office of the Commandant of the, of the United States Coast Guard. Samantha graduated or attended Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University, at which time she got her pilot's license and set her life in motion, putting it mildly. Wilma decided to enlist in the United States Coast Guard, where she was, after boot camp in 2009, she was assigned to an interdiction operation out of St. Petersburg, Florida. I can't quite imagine some of the challenges of de dealing with that assignment in these difficult days. Today, Samantha is assigned to the Com Commandant's Office of the, of the United States Coast Guard, and she is responsible for the safety and transportation of the Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. We're indeed pleased to have with us to Samantha Whitaker. Women in the military, formally, are somewhat of a new phenomenon, certainly in the 20th century, as I was in the service when we in the Air Force were integrated with women in, the, in the, my particular unit. I remember how we prepared our base for the first women to come in a rather isolated place in Turkey. Uh, quite fun on one hand and quite um, uh, nerve-wracking on the other. Nobody knew exactly what to do. I don't understand that. I have a family. We all have families. That sort of made sense to me. And they have not just performed valiantly. They today are the critical piece of our success the United States of America. So I'm pleased to ask uh, General Helms to kind of give us a little bit of her background, entrance into the military, and of course, what is it like to touch the stars? No thought. Well, thank you. Um, in an audience such as this one, I'd be remiss if I didn't 
say sorry about that commanders in chief trophy, folks. <laughs> but um, I know, I know. It's nice to get it back. <laughs> exactly um, right. So speaking of the Air Force Academy, that is uh, where I started my career. My dad was a pilot in the Air Force. Uh, he flew in all different kinds of aircraft, notably the uh, Huey rescue helicopter. And I uh, grew up in Portland, Oregon, where he had been assigned to um, the 304th Air Rescue out there in Portland. Um, I knew I always wanted to be in the military. I just didn't know exactly how I would fit. And it turned out that the best fit for me was to come in as an engineer. Uh, so I decided to major in aer aeronautical engineering at the Air Force Academy and uh, entered from there. Uh, as I moved along in my career, uh, I was a natural, it turned out, at uh, test engineering. And as I moved higher and higher up the rank, of test engineering, which of course usually involves attending a test pilot school to go through the test engineer course, it turned out that uh, test engineering was uh, a skill set that NASA was interested in for selecting for the pool of their astronauts. And along the way, I was encouraged by an astronaut, Dick Covey. Uh, many of you may know Dick Covey from um, the first selected class to, f to be prepared to go on the space shuttle. He was an Air Force astronaut, and he encouraged me to apply to the program. I did. I got selected, and in 1991, as mentioned, I did move to NASA at the Johnson Space Center. But I always retained my military identity, as did all of the military folks who were selected to be astronauts. Uh, Twelve years later, when the time came to leave the NASA astronaut office, primarily because I'd had more than my fair share of space travel, um, I decided to go back to the military and give back. 9-11 had just happened. I felt like there was more for me to do. I felt like I could contribute to the national military space programs, and that is what I did. And I only just recently retired uh, in April. But in that opportunity to uh, be at NASA, uh, which I full-heartedly give uh, the Air Force total credit for setting me up to success to, to become an astronaut, um, by the way, the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard, and the Marines can do the same. We've got astronauts of all flavors in, in the astronaut corps from all the services, as well as civilians. Uh, I will tell you that I had uh, wo not one, but two types of space experiences. The first type um, was the obvious type, that is to fly on the space shuttle. From the physiological standpoint, flying on the space shuttle is obviously uh, grounded in incredible excitement for the astronauts that get selected to do such a thing, and it is an extremely high honor and a lot of luck to, to be selected. Um, you are prepared to go on the day of liftoff. Uh, you know your technical training has been, been accomplished. If you're a rookie, uh, you nothing, absolutely nothing, would persuade you to walk away from the opportunity to do that kind of experience, and so it was with my first flight. The impressions I have from my first flight on the shuttle was um, what a rocket ride. Clearly, it's a, uh, an incredible experience lifting off on a controlled explosion. That's how we often describe those rockets that lift the shuttle off the ground. And then uh, just eight and a half minutes later, after the engines and the tail of the space shuttle cut off, because you are in effect high enough, you go from three Gs of uh, load to zero G in the matter of less than a second. And that sensation, the physiological sensation of what it feels like, I tell people that it's not, unco it's not unlike being at the top of a roller coaster and heading off in that free fall down the steepest hill you can imagine of a roller coaster. And that's what it feels like, except the free fall never stops. The interesting part about the physiological aspect of spaceflight is that the human body gets used to it pretty quickly. Um, it's well, well documented that uh, astronauts can be prone to space sickness. It's a little bit different than air sickness and sea sickness. It's a completely different phenomenon. You can't predict in advance who will and who won't. But uh, the good news is that um, space sickness is easily fixable, easily treatable, and uh, space shuttle crews after they preserve the first day for getting adjusted to space or full up rounds and start to execute the mission. Uh, you are very mission focused and the space shuttle flights themselves are very, very uh, tightly scheduled because time is precious. The shuttle can only fly for about a few weeks when it was flying. 
and you spent that entire time uh, moving from task to task to task, five to seven crew members, so much to do. Very, you only fly in the sp space shuttle maybe at the most eight or nine times a year when it was in its best years and at its worst only one or two times a year. And every minute counts. Uh, so it was a TDY. Uh, they gave us uh, government orders to do it. Um, we, when we came back, we had to file travel vouchers <laughs> because it is a government trip. But you, people often ask, what do you get paid to fly in space? And I'd like to tell people, um, well, on government orders, you have your government-provided transportation. That's the space shuttle. You have your government-provided lodging. That's also the space shuttle. And you have your government-provided food. That's the space food on the space shuttle. Uh, so we would get paid that $3 a day incidental that cost too much red tape to turn off, even though we couldn't <laughs> spend it anywhere. And uh, on my first space flight of six days, I got paid $12.06. Oh, wow. <laughs> great story. So, great story. Too bad you couldn't get paid by the mile. Uh, 85 million miles in 11, 211 days when it was all said and done would have been a lot of frequent flyer miles, but no, it was just uh, travel vouchers and almost everything was government provided. Uh, I mentioned a second kind of space experience. My last space flight, and I will try to keep this short because I know we want time for questions, and we also want time to hear from the other panel members, obviously. Um, my last space flight was not a two-way trip. It was a one-way trip, and the destination was the International Space Station, where I lived on board the International Space Station for uh, almost six months with two other people, uh, another American and a Russian. So uh, the space flight experience was at a completely different level, and living on a space outpost, just the three of you, now six, is a completely different psychological experience than living on what is in effect something that looks a lot like an airplane, just flies a lot higher, and can come down if there's an emergency. On the space station, the way they handle, um, first of all, there's a, there's a prime directive in space flight. Thou shalt always have a way to abandon ship and return to Earth. And so on the space station, there is a Russian capsule called the Soyuz, which provides our ability to return to Earth at any time. But it is a different psychological experience to live on a space outpost with a minimal emergency system from the standpoint of coming home due to a medical emergency or fire or toxic or decompression. And, um, and of the two types of experiences, I would tell you by far the more... Uh, adventurous and rewarding was living on a space outpost. The psychology of doing so was completely different. Earth was a different place than where we were. And you don't usually get that feeling when you're on the space shuttle. In the space shuttle, you just feel like you're traveling. Well, every astronaut has a different experience, but in my case, you're very high, but you're very connected to Earth, and it, you're just an extension of Earth because you're talking to mission control all the time. On the space station, you're at an outpost with calm out hours sometimes, maybe even a couple days at times. And, um, and that was a true human exploration opportunity that uh, I cannot under, under praise. I can't imagine what, how, how one adjusts to that mentally. Uh, as you just said about no communication for a day and sometimes more than a day. And, you're, you're out there and, oh my goodness. I, I, I like to tell the Navy folks that I met in the joint world after I came back how living on the space station was probably not unlike the experience of living in a submarine. Um, no. Port, starboard, yes, we used all that. Uh, it's just the view was a heck of a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> but the experience of being self-sustaining with minimal communications at times and having a mission and having a, you know, days, weeks, months of executing that mission on a deployment, if you will, Cor was terrific. completely different than a space shuttle experience. And I don't think a lot of people understand that they are different experiences. Now, the third experience will be the tourism experience, which is coming. Um, in spite of uh, the unfortunate tragedy of Spaceship Two last week, that's, in the big scheme of things, that's a blip. 
That's exactly right. Um, That's and right. tourism is coming, and all of you young people in the audience will get your chance to fly in space. Whether it's a months-long opportunity or a minutes-long opportunity is a different question. But I'm fully well, convinced that folks will get past these issues and, uh, and progress will continue, because it is human destiny to explore. We're looking forward to that book about life on a space outpost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, well, Wilma, your experiences are quite different, I can only assume, and uh, I certainly must assume, and I'm, we're anxious to hear about how you came in an adjustment period, you, you've seen a lot and, and, and dealt with a lot of challenges yourself as you rose up through the ranks and made a, a wonderful career in the United States military. So tell us about your, give us your story. I would have to say that my experience in the military, and specifically the Air Force, was as different as uh, day and night from Cyril Helms, uh, because things had changed for women so much from the time I went in to when she went in. When I went in, it was 1957, and it was 1948 when women became, had the opportunity to become full-fledged members of the military. Now, we talk a lot about uh, our history going back to the American Revolution, but let me tell you, the only women who served in the military in the American Revolution were those who disguised themselves as men and enlisted. The others may have gotten recognition for doing something uh, heroic, but they weren't members of the military. And that was true clear through the Spanish-American War. And it, and it wasn't until 1901 when the Army Nurse Corps was formed that women had a role, but they were in the reserve. They weren't full-fledged military members. And the same was true in World War I and in World War II. They were in for the duration plus six months. So when I came in, we were very limited as to what we could do. Now I came in in a little. I came in an easy way to get commission compared to what Gerald Helms did going through the academy, because they were short of women officers, and they had a program that if you had a college degree and an appropriate background of working or whatever, you could apply and get a commission in the reserve as a second lieutenant or perhaps because of your work background as high as a captain. So I came in uh, as a second lieutenant, and then I went to school. And my training was a world different than what she would have gone through or what you would have gone through because we went through charm school training. We learned how to put on makeup, and we knew how, learned how to be nice young ladies if we didn't already know. And uh, we didn't go through any kind of weapon training uh, we did jump off a tower. You could volunteer to do that, and I did. Uh, but that was about the extent of anything exciting in the way of training other than marching. And we learned about the service and various things and how to be a leader and something like that. And we were pretty much limited to being in the medical area or the administrative area. We weren't off doing exciting things like aircraft mechanics and things like that. Women didn't do those kind of things. And not only that, we were limited in a number of other ways. Uh, number one, we didn't get benefits the same as men did. So if you got married, your husband couldn't get an ID card, couldn't go to the base exchange, the commissary, or get medical care. You couldn't live on base with your husband. It was almost as if you didn't have one of those things. Uh, <laughs> It certainly wasn't any benefit to you in terms of the military. And, it, and if um, you got married, uh, you might even get discharged because in some of the, like nurses or something like that, they weren't taking any married women at times. And if you got pregnant, let me tell you, that was the quickest way to get out of the service because the day you were diagnosed as being pregnant was probably the day you were discharged. And it didn't make any difference. If you thought you could continue to perform and wanted to, you were gone. And uh, 
you, uh, the ROTC wasn't open to women. The academies weren't open to women. There were courses that women never got selected for. Uh, we were limited as to how far we could be promoted because the legislation in 1948 specifically said that women could not be admirals or generals. And we were limited uh, from the standpoint of promotion as an officer to uh, basically to lieutenant colonel or commander because we only had nine positions authorized for captain or colonel. So I could aspire to be the director of women in the Air Force, one position if I chose to. And if I served in that, I would say serve for the, I wasn't promoted, I was appointed, I would have been app appointed, and if I chose to stay in after the period of my appointment, I would be reduced in rank to lieutenant colonel until I retired, at which point I would be promoted again. So it was a world different. You didn't fly aircraft. You didn't get assigned to ships for any reason. So it was, uh, and that was by law. And if you went in the Women's Army Corps, you were forbidden from being in combat. Now the rest of us weren't by law forbidden from being in combat, but it was pretty well accepted that it was not the intent of the Congress or the country that we be in, in combat. And that didn't change, basically until Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, when by then we were about uh, nine or 10 percent of the number of, of people in the service, and we uh, were essential to some units, and if those units were going to perform their mission, they had to take their women with them. And of course, then came Iraq and Afghanistan, and that totally changed, and we had women doing all kinds of of things. And beginning in the 1970s, they started training uh, WACs on the use of weapons, and slowly the other uh, services picked up on that. Did you get trained on the use of weapons when you went through training? You did. That's what I thought. So did you get it at the academy? I did. M16s. So uh, it was a world different. Uh, I was very fortunate in some of the things that I got to do. I got to spend four years in Spain from 1959 to 64. I spent uh, six months on Guam as a member of the uh, uh, aircraft wing that was flying uh, the B-52 missions, dropping bombs on Vietnam. And I was the first woman to ever deploy with a unit like that. And let me tell you what the odds were. There were 3,000 men in the wing and me. I thought that was about the right <laughs> proportion. <laughs> and that was a fascinating thing because, you know, that was my first time to be anyways close to, anywhere close to war and to see what the reaction was among the men. And let me tell you, they did a tremendous job of preparing those planes for missions and recovering from missions. And then I spent uh, a year in Saigon, Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. And again, that was different than today, because when I found out I was being assigned there, my first question was, do I need to qualify on weapons? Because if I'm going into a combat zone, I thought I should be qualified. And they said, no, you don't. You won't be taking a weapon. You won't be issued a weapon. So I went home on leave and got my brother-in-law, who was very skilled with weapons, to teach me how to fire, because I was not going into an area like that <laughs> unless I knew how to use a weapon. And, and I, it happened. I was assigned to Military Assistance Command Vietnam, so I stayed in the city of Saigon, basically. And... Uh, I lived downtown about a block and a half from the Central Market, which was a target occasionally for the Vietnam, Viet Cong to send rockets. And I remember awakening a, one morning at about 5.30 on a Sunday morning to get ready to go to work. We worked seven days a week. Um, and I heard this 
boom. And I thought, aha, a rocket attack, just like in World War II. And that's what it was. But before I could get up to the top of the building, it had in, to see where it, what was happening, it was over. And uh, so that was that and an attack, a rocket attack against the embassy when I happened to be uh, walking about a, a block and a half from it were the only, that was the closest I came to combat. This was a nurses war from the standpoint of women. There were 7,500 of us, 82% of the women were nurses. So uh, that was my tour in, uh, in Vietnam. I had an unusual career in the other standpoint, and, and in a sense, Gerald Holmes and my experience was similar in that where I happened to be stationed a good share of the time, and particularly at the beginning, I was one of few uh, women. Uh, when I went to Spain, I was one of, I think, uh, there, was, uh, there were nurses, another officer, and one enlisted woman. When I came back to McCoy Air Force Base in Orlando, Florida, there was a senior lieutenant colonel, a nurse, captain, myself, and an enlisted woman who was there because her husband was. So my time was spent uh, being in the minority. But it was a wonderful experience. I spent 28 and a half years. Um, it, I spent it in the comptroller field other than my last three years when I was the commander of the US military entrance processing uh, system. So, and that was uh, an interesting thing because we had 72 different uh, so-called MAPS, military entrance processing stations from Maine to Puerto Rico to Guam, Hawaii, and Alaska. And lots of places here in the United States in between, and I visited every one of those places uh, to see what was going on and to be sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So that was a lot of traveling in the course of three years. So those were the highlights, uh, a little bit on the differences. And of course, she was in the first class of women to go to the academy. And you know, if you want to know how obstacles get overcome, or how they have been overcome in the military, let me tell you how it was. It, we had usually lower grade officers or lower grade enlisted people who had the courage to, to sue the secretary of their service or the secretary of defense and say they were being deprived of their constitutional right to whatever it was they were suing about. And there were suits on women being on ships at sea, on benefits, on marriage, on pregnancy, on having children in your household, on going to the academies, and on and on. And that continues yet today. But that was the basis of how most of the change came about with those women who had the courage to do that. We've come a long way, but we no question we still have a long way to go. Uh, I was kind of curious as Amen. to... Amen. <laughs> uh, I wasn't aware of when you were uh, responsible for military entrance processing, but I didn't know whether I could blame you for those shots that I got when I went through... Uh, uh, I didn't have anything to do with giving shots. Okay. <laughs> I just had something to do with giving you a physical exam before you went in and giving you a mental test to see if you uh, were smart enough to be in. Uh, and, um, in my case, I'm and then not so shipping, sure they didn't make a mistake. And, having, and we also, you, that's when you held up your right hand and swore to defend, and that we were the ones who put you on the plane, the train, the bus, or whatever it was, to get to your training base. I'll never forget my first day, from, uh, 19, August the 8th of 1962. I can remember it as clear as can be when I held up that right hand and swore to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. V remember it very clearly, and I thank you very much for your service. Well, and also, I didn't have anything to do with your getting your hair cut if you were one of those. <laughs> Samantha, 
you've uh, you come in at the other end of this trail. Uh, you had some rather interesting, I'm sure, experiences as well as the challenges as, as we just talked about. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. But anxious to hear your story. How did you end up where you are? Where did it start? And, and uh, what drives you today in the service of our country? Okay, well, first I want to say it's a tough act to follow. Um, these women are absolutely amazing. Uh, so my story started in, uh, at Embry-Riddle. Um, and I did not foresee myself in the military at all. My roommate, she was actually a uh, Navy ROTC, and I remember she would wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning and, you know, get her PT clothes on. I'm like, God, you know, why do you do that to yourself? <laughs> it ended up that she never went into the Navy, and I'm in the military. Um, <laughs> so it didn't quite work out how I wanted. However, uh, the reason why I joined the Coast Guard was because a uh, Coast Guard helicopter actually landed on campus. Um, and I was there, my career field was going to be an airline pilot. So I was there, I got my uh, pilot's license, and uh, the helo landed, and I, I started learning about the Coast Guard, because I had no idea you know, what they were, what they did. Um, and they landed, you know, they spoke to me a little bit, and I was fascinated. So I, th I believe it was a month to the day, I uh, contacted the recruiting office, and I enlisted. Uh, I left Embry-Riddle. Uh, I went to boot camp in 2009. Uh, and I was shipped to uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, where I was on a 110. Uh, it's a patrol boat. And we patrolled the Florida Straits. We'd go to Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, um, Jamaica, Virgin Islands, all those places. And our main missions were uh, alien interdictions and narcotics. So I have. Uh, that's where my love for law enforcement came about. I was on a, uh, a boarding team, so we would uh, go on these vessels and we would make sure that you know they're not carrying any narcotics, as long well as um, intervening the uh, Cuban chugs and Haitians that would come try to flee to our, uh, our country. Uh, so after that, I decided that my specialty would be law enforcement. So I went to MEA school, which is Maritime Enforcement, and uh, pretty much became a cop for the Coast Guard. And uh, I was then deployed to uh, Morgan City, Louisiana. I was in the bayou, so it was uh, quite a culture change from Florida to, you know, Cajun world. Uh, but the food was great. Uh, so there I actually became the uh, law enforcement petty officer. So I oversaw the qualifications, uh, range times, uh, I was the law enforcement instructor, so I, I was the only one who was able to sign off um, all the members PQS from, you know, E3 all the way to captain. Uh, from there, uh, there is an opening for commandant driver, and what that entails is you are on the protective service detail, and you take him wherever he needs to go, you make sure nobody embarrasses him, nobody hurts him. I'm sure you guys saw him, he's on the screens out in the lobby. Uh, I applied for it, and I got it. So I'm here, and uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. In, in, in None of us ever know what's going to happen in our lives as the twist and turns and opportunities come and go. And glad to see you have taken advantage of those opportunities. And who knows what the future is going to bring, but we're excited about that future for you. So we're... Anxious now to turn to you. You've heard three very different perspectives on women in the military and their experiences. We'd like very much to hear from you all. So questions, I see a microphone headed down. Yes, ma'am, please. Hi, thank you for your service. Um, my question is for Lieutenant General Helms. Can you speak a little bit about your daily training as an astronaut and what you thought may have been your uh, most difficult task during that training? Uh, yes. Um, thank you for the question. I think everyone heard it. Uh, the ultimate space camp is one way to describe it. Um, but I will tell you that the training for the space shuttle flights was obviously different than the training for the space station flights. And that gets to what was most difficult. 
uh, on the space shuttle flights, the training was really centered around understanding the space shuttle, simulating working in the space shuttle, managing failure modes of the space shuttle. And then, of course, it wasn't just the space shuttle on a mission, but you also had payloads and uh, other tasks to do possibly like spacewalks, robotic operations, photography, press conferences. Uh, a press conference won't go well if the crew doesn't know how to set up the cameras. So the training spans everything from photography to medical training. Um, each time I flew on the space shuttle or the space station, I was the chief medical officer, I think. And so I had to learn how to also do surgical procedures and um, some first aid that was at a higher level than a typical person. We rode around in ambulances uh, helping out folks and trying to understand how to do that kind of training. That was really geared toward the space station training. Again, six months on orbit, um, there is no emergency room just down the road, you've got to be able to manage a lot of these emergencies yourself. The ultimate way to manage a, a medical emergency, of course, is to abandon ship and bring the crew home, but that's really drastic. If you have someone on board that can manage it at a lower level, that would be good. So I learned how to do a lot of that kind of training. Uh, the hardest training, and I think a lot of astronauts would agree with me, is the space station is international. And it is, however anyone else wants to describe it, I'm going to call it what it is, bilingual. And it is American and Russian. When you go to the Russian part of the space station, all the buttons are in Russian, the procedures are in Russian. The Americans did do some um, work on doing translated procedure sets. The problem is all your training is in Russian too. I mean the Russian language. So we would fly to Moscow, take a... Um, a driver van out to Star City, and we'd live in Star City for weeks at a time, getting our training on the Russian part of the space station. And all those instructors are Russian. They don't know English. So um, uh, we basically learned Russian, or had to learn Russian, in order to be fully capable of executing our mission across the whole of the space station. With just three people, you really had to manage everything. Um, not just the American segment, but the Russian segment as well. And learning Russian was an albatross around my neck, the hardest thing I ever did. When I had free time, I was studying flashcards, um, trying to converse. I had a tutor. They didn't send us to the Defense Language Institute. We were doing it all as an additional duty, if I could put it that way, learning how to speak a language to the level where you're actually uh, competent on orbit and can read the procedures and not screw up what you need to do. Um, so I would say lear learning the language was the toughest thing. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't stick with you when you don't use it. So uh, I was really pretty good about 12 years ago at Russian. Um, but today, not so much. Um, maybe if I get a few vodkas in me, it'll come back pretty quickly. <laughs> but, but, uh, but right now, you would think of all the things that we did learning a language wouldn't have been the thing that would come to mind. But for me, that was the most difficult thing that had to be done, in part because it had to be done as a, an additional duty. Uh, we did not have time in our training program to do a year of language training at the Defense Language Institute. That was studied and then quickly thrown to the side because there was just no time. Um, so thank you. The next question, please. Uh, ladies, thank you for speaking today and being pioneers. Of in the military. Um, my question has more to do with the social aspect of you uh, being in the military. My uh, mother was in the Air Force as well about 30 years ago, and uh, we talked extensively about some of the stigmatisms and prejudices that she had to overcome uh, joining a, a boys club, so to speak, as my, my father likes to call it sometimes. Um, so I was just wondering from uh, your guys' experience, about how you had to overcome that um, and what sort of things you had to do, so. Uh, I'll answer this quickly. The question is, um, how did we cope with the stigmas of being female in the military? I think is the general question, correct? A and really, I think we see three eras here. We see the early era before the military really began to embrace women my era was the beginning of the embracement stage, and then today, of course, it's a completely different culture. 
um, I'll, I'll just say that my coping skill was to be competent. Um, I could wipe out the issues that we had with some men who just didn't want women around, and I was in some fields where I was one of a kind. Um, but to get around that, and then by that I mean also in the Russian cosmonaut program, I was, women are not prevalent, so I was there even years later, one of a kind. And to get around it, I think my best strategy was to be the most competent person who was in the group. And it worked, I think. The Russians were, um, and the Americans, I think when they recognize true competence, a lot of other issues fall by the wayside. I had grown up during the uh, uh, World War II uh, on a farm and I got the pleasure with, with my dad's supervision of working out in the field an awful lot. I was pretty good at driving a tractor and doing stuff like that. So I was used to working with men. So when I came in the service, I had been working uh, at an atomic energy installation uh, for the DuPont company for five years. So I wasn't uh, young. I had been working with men, and I either ignored those kind of things or I tried to use humor. But the thing that I can tell you that used to annoy me more than any other one thing would be to go to a meeting, and I went to more meetings than I care to remember, that I was the only woman in the room. And I'm sure that General Holmes did the same thing. And I would be talking to the next speaker, and he would go up and say, gentlemen. And as I gained in rank, I had a simple solution for that. I stood up and said, my stars, I have changed sex. <laughs> and I can tell you, he never made that mistake again in my presence. <laughs> so believe it or not, in today's world, I have actually experienced um, not in the military service, but carrying out my duties. Uh, as a boarding officer, I am the lead law enforcement officer doing boardings. Uh, this includes mom and pop boardings, fisheries boardings, uh, high risk uh, interest vessel boardings, anything, you know, I, I was there. And uh, I actually came across uh, a fishery vessel. And in school, you know, they do a one little sentence, uh, there are some fishermen that are very su superstitious, and they believe that women on their vessels are bad luck. And it was just one little sentence, you know, you kind of, you read it, go through school, it's the last thing, you know, you ever think about. So I was a boarding officer, and I come across this uh, fishery vessel, and he says, I can't come on board. And I said, do you, do you not know you know, I'm Coast Guard, I have the authority, jurisdiction, I can come on board, you know, as I please. And he said, it's, it's bad luck for you to be on my boat. And I was like, okay, well, how, how do I manage this? You know, I, I can't let my boarding team go on by themselves, and I can't just not board this vessel as well. And uh, luckily, the vessel was, uh, was small enough, I believe it was about a 40-foot vessel, so when our small boat came up to it, I was able to see you know, the whole vessel, the cabin, there was a bunch of windows so I could see where my, uh, my boarding team was. So it wouldn't uh, impede our boarding and their safety wasn't gonna be at risk because I could see what was going on. So I told this gentleman, okay, I will respect your belief and your superstition, but I will make a compromise. Um, and I told him, I will stand right here because I can see my boarding team. And if there's any violations, if my boarding team, I feel that their safety is compromised, I'm gonna get on board. He said, you know what? That sounds like a deal. So <coughs> the fishery uh, community is very small. Everybody knows each other because they all want the same spot. They all want you know, the good fishing spot. And uh, a few months later, I came across another fishery vessel and I was like, okay gonna happen again, you know? And he was like, oh, didn't you, uh, are you that girl that boarded my friend Sean? And I was like, uh, you know, I started describing the guy. He's like, yeah. It's like, yes, sir. He's like, you can come on board. I was like, roger that. That's good. <laughs> uh, so even today, 
Um, 2014, it happens. Um, and I haven't experienced it in the military, but in the civilian world, there are a lot of beliefs, strong beliefs, that women are bad luck. So be careful for you women, you know, if you come across a uh, fishery vessel. <laughs> thank you. We have time for one last question. I just wanted to say thank you for coming out today. Um, as a female in the military, just starting out with my career, uh, any advice you would give to kind of new airmen and new sailors, all of us that are just starting out that don't really know how we can kind of be that like empowering female figure in the military, any like kind of advice on that? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you uh, another coping strategy that I used. And when, you know, when we all entered the academy in that very first year, uh, I think at some level we made some mistakes in how we did the integration uh, with the rest of the cadet wing and really how we were preparing ourselves to integrate with the rest of the Air Force. And um, we all thought we had to act like men in order to integrate. And I think we all now realize that was a mistake. I, five years or so after graduation, numerous classmates, my female classmates, we would get together and we'd talk about the fact that, you know, that was not helpful for our self-esteem and for other reasons to try to be someone we're not. And, and so I think that um, the key is to be yourself, even if you're female. And I like to say, be a, a terrific sister in a brotherhood, you know, but you don't have to be a brother. You can be a sister, uh, but you've got to be yourself. And in my career, and I'm talking just under 38 years, you know, the higher I got in rank, the easier it got, that kind of stuff. But, but you know, up to the colonel level, I'd say, I only ran across maybe five people, guys, who didn't adjust when they got educated about what women could do when women were a competent sister among a brotherhood. As, and the, 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 the space shuttle guys were worried about flying with women and I just tell them, don't worry about it. It's all gonna work out and it always did. Uh, so really, I think a lot of it is that some folks just come from a experience base that is not quite that broad. And once they get the experience, and get their eyes open a little bit about how life really is uh, in the world of diversity, usually it all pretty much goes away. But you will still find people that once in a while can't handle it. Um, don't change your strategy, though. One thing I'd like to comment on that hasn't been mentioned, and that's what's happened on the promotion scene. Uh, at the time I was promoted, I think there were three two-star women generals and I was promoted in 1980. When I retired in 1985, I was the senior ranking woman in the armed forces as a brigadier general. That's 1985. That isn't so very long ago. And uh, so we have here a three star. We now have uh, three four stars, but that's, how much progress has made, been made. And that's not a whole lot of progress. We do have a lot of two star and three stars now that we didn't have then. But imagine, 1985, a senior ranking in the armed forces, Brigadier General. Uh, to your question, I would say just be confident. And uh, if you have a career path and you have a dream, a goal, go for it. You know, it's go step outside your comfort zone, put yourself out there. Um, and just have confidence. If you have confidence, you can do whatever you want. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> General Helms, General Vaught, Samantha Whitaker, thank you all very much. Our next program will begin in just about five minutes, maybe even less, well, like, more like two minutes, I'm told. So stay seated. We're, and I'm hopeful you Wait, all. No. Been traveling, dinnered, event. We had two events uh, yesterday. Tomorrow we have a the afternoon with a. Uh,
stage production of the memorial. Oh, my gosh. So I, I want to give you my card. Is that okay? Yeah, I would love it. Okay. <coughs> it, and you can see I don't have any jobs. <laughs> I did do training in Huntsville. Yes, I did. I was in that pool a number of times. So, <laughs> very proud. Thank you very much, Wilma. Thank you. So, Samantha, here. Stay Thank in you touch. very much. Let me know what you're up to. Thank you very much. And my first driver locked us both out of the car, so don't do that. Oh, no. <laughs> that is not good. <laughs> so, but, but you probably studied it full time, right? Yes, that's the easy way to do it. That's the way to do it, but it's still hard. It's still hard. Hi there. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Are you registered for the Sorry, memorial? I couldn't help myself. No, I'm not. We're full of Navy and Army. I had to bring it up. We need to get that done. Thank you very much. Are you registered? Thank you. I am. Oh, great. That's the best thing that you can Any of this resonate with you then? Quite a bit? Okay. Good. I'm not talking about it. You're not eligible. Even today, I have one. Oh, sexism, it is the way that you do it. You're an ROTC. Yes, I'm here. It's the day of women. I mean, look at Calgary. It's the day I lived up on the I had no choice. So I'm just going to be in the face of... Thank you. 